Hello, my name is John Livingston, and in this video I will give you a short introduction to EMI and RFI in the nuclear industry. Ultimately, the engineer needs to be able to navigate the myriad array of national and international EMI RFI laws and standards to ensure new digital equipment installed in nuclear power plants conforms to the NRC's guidelines. This task can be overwhelming if approached without any prior training in the basics. This video will introduce you to the fundamentals of EMI and RFI in the commercial and military sectors because they supply the foundational building blocks used to construct the NRC's guidelines. Electromagnetic interference that's created by digital and other electronic devices is a major concern at nuclear power plants. It is also a serious concern for any company that produces consumer products for two reasons. First, it is required by law that any digital device sold in the United States limit its electromagnetic emissions. The FCC has placed restrictions on the emissions, both radiated and conducted, that's produced by electronic products. Second, because any product sold that crashes or goes haywire Whenever it gets close to any electronic equipment, it's not going to sell very well in this day and age. So not only must an electronic product not interfere with nearby equipment, it also must be able to accept interference from other devices and still function properly if it is expected to satisfy consumers. Finally, it must also not interfere with itself for the same reasons just stated. In short, a digital or electronic device must be compatible with its environment. This branch of electrical engineering today is called electromagnetic compatibility, or EMC for short. In the past, it was referred to with acronyms like EMI and RFI, which are short for electromagnetic interference and radio frequency interference. The field is now referred to in more positive light by replacing the word interference with compatibility. This change in preference has not yet penetrated into the nuclear industry. It is still referred to there as EMI and RFI. Generally speaking, RFI is a subset of EMI. EMI refers to the broad frequency range available to the entire electromagnetic spectrum, or DC to daylight, as my professor used to say. RFI refers to a limited but broad frequency band within the overall spectrum, typically considered to be 3 kHz to 300 GHz. It may seem strange at first to call this band limited, but it makes sense when you consider that the spectrum of electromagnetic waves visible to the human eye, for example, corresponds to the band between approximately 430 and 790 terahertz. Ultraviolet rays extend from about 840 terahertz up to 30 petahertz. And X-rays extend from there up to 30 exahertz. And let's not forget standard commercial power, which rocks along at a cool 60 hertz in the United States and 50 hertz in Europe. So, all things considered, the RFI band is really just the beginning in terms of the total electromagnetic spectrum but in practical terms, it covers most radio-like devices in use today. AM radio broadcasts from 531 kHz to 1.6 MHz, while FM radio occupies the 88 to 108 MHz band. Handheld radios can be anywhere from 2 to 900 MHz, with CB radio centered around 30 MHz. Wi-Fi routers operate in the 2.4 GHz and 5 GHz bands. Microwave ovens also operate in the 2.4 GHz band. Radar is common and used by the military and commercial entities for anything from traffic control to weather detection to high-resolution surface mapping. These technologies use frequencies that range from 50 MHz up to 40 GHz. Since we've gotten an idea of what kind of products may generate emissions, let's take a quick look at how digital noise produces interference. The emphasis in the nuclear industry is on interference. Interference is caused by electromagnetic emissions. There are two kinds of emissions that we're concerned about, 
conducted and radiated. Both can create more trouble than you may at first realize. If we look at a simple diagram of a piece of equipment connected to a typical power panel, we can see how the emissions may propagate. At first glance, the only frequency that should be on the power cables is that of the 60 Hz power supplying the equipment. But a noisy digital component using a high frequency microprocessor that's installed inside a larger piece of equipment, such as a circuit board installed inside of an indoor air conditioning unit, can generate emissions that are conducted back down any of the physical cables connected to it. This includes the power cables. Those emissions can then propagate upstream to the power panel. From there, they can escape onto the upstream grid and propagate into other equipment and have unexpected effects. Or they can escape into the ground grid where they can disrupt the ideal ground potential by developing a voltage on the ground grid which we call a ground drop. This can create problems such as ground loops in which the ground connection points for different equipment are at different voltages. Normally, we think that ground is just ground and that all ground connections are at zero volts. But when ground grids are contaminated by stray noise currents, those currents produce a voltage difference between the ground points. This voltage difference then produces its own noise current flowing between ground connections. This ground loop manifests itself in audio-video equipment as an audible hum coming through the speakers. The hum is undesirable. Besides conducted emissions, digital devices produce radiated emissions. High frequency emissions can easily couple onto short and long wires, circuit board traces, and even certain kinds of structures. At high frequencies, the wires and circuit board traces act as effective, though unintentional, antennas that launch propagating waves into free space. Those waves can then couple onto other wires, structures, or into circuit boards installed in other equipment and create interference by inducing undesired noise currents. A modern example of this is the noise induced in speakers by cell phone signals. Sometimes my computer or car speakers will announce in advance if I am about to receive a text or phone call. That's because the signals transmitted between the cell tower and the phone couple into the wires and circuits of the speakers, then the internal audio processing electronics unintentionally convert those signals into audio signals because they mistake the noise for information. To throw gasoline on the fire, wires that are carrying unintentional conducted emissions, like power cables infected with high-frequency noise currents, can also turn into unintentional antennas. The conducted emissions turn into radiated emissions. As you can see, if EMC is neglected in a product's design, then the electromagnetic environment can quickly become polluted with noise of all kinds. EMC is a particular concern to nuclear plants for a couple of reasons. Perhaps more than any other industry, it values public health and safety above everything else. The NRC exists to develop safety requirements that every nuclear plant must adhere to in order to operate, and the NRC has the power to enforce them by imposing fines on or even seeking imprisonment of any violators. So clearly the risk of any electronic device interfering with nearby equipment and causing it to operate unexpectedly or in unexpected ways is a serious concern to the NRC and therefore to the plant operators. Some electrical devices are more critical than others. Class 1E circuit breakers, for example, perform safety-related functions, and they are intended to isolate non-safety related power from safety related power. Their purpose is to enable the smooth and uninterrupted operation of critical safety related equipment by guarding against disturbances created by non-safety related equipment. But if their function is interfered with by nearby electronic equipment, this protective role can be defeated and with it a major pillar in the NRC's regulatory strategy for keeping the public safe from accidental radiation releases. There have been several documented occurrences of such incidents over the years, with one example from the early 90s providing a helpful illustration. A certain model GE breaker fitted with solid-state digital trip units 
spuriously tripped after encountering some unrelated electrical transients. These breakers were installed at multiple power plants, and in at least two cases, the breakers tripped at two different plants because of electromagnetic interference. There was no serious problem created by the tripping breakers, but they can be seen as an example of what the risks of EMI to safety-related equipment look like. The NRC has provided an account of several other examples of EMC-related product failures in its Regulatory Guide 1.180, Revision 1. Another important reason EMC must be considered at nuclear plants is the prevalence of older equipment that is starting to be replaced by modern equipment. Modern equipment has been through several rounds and several years of practice with dealing with EMC. These days, new products and equipment are designed from the ground up with EMC in mind. At least, the savvy products are. They contain different kinds of filtering and shielding and implement optimal wiring and circuit board layout practices to reduce both their emissions and susceptibility. Older equipment, however, is missing much of the protection granted by these years of EMC design advances. Older equipment can range from analog 120 volt control relays to earlier generation digital controllers and microprocessors. The GE trip units just mentioned are a good example of early generation digital controllers. They had filters built in to block interference, but evidently they weren't tuned to block the noise encountered in those particular events. Most new equipment has some kind of digital device in it. It's getting increasingly hard to find analog-only equipment for use as replacements in nuclear plants. Even though new digital equipment typically ships with EMC precautions in place, some of the old equipment can still be particularly sensitive to even low levels of electromagnetic radiation. That's why the NRC has endorsed various testing standards that verify that new plant equipment actually limit their emissions and susceptibility. But figuring out what the new requirements are can be confusing because of the multiple sources of information. We'll now go through them so you can have an idea of what's involved. EMC product testing has been in place for a while now in the commercial world. EMC issues began in the military realm in the United States and spread to the commercial realm when the FCC issued their rules in the 1970s. Various regulations have been in place in Europe since the early 1950s, with the first distinctive EMC directive coming into force there in the mid-90s. The European regulations are far, far more comprehensive than those of the FCC. The FCC requires that all digital devices having clock frequencies greater than 9 kHz be tested and shown to comply with their limits or else they cannot be legally sold in the U.S. The FCC requires that products only pass emissions testing. The FCC has no requirement governing a product's susceptibility to emissions from other electronic devices. The FCC is only concerned with limiting the amount of radiation pollution produced by new products. In that regard, the FCC got involved in the business of capping emissions long before the Green Movement did. The European regulations require emissions testing, but they also have requirements for limiting susceptibility to interference from other digital and electronic devices. They call this product immunity. There is an entire battery of tests performed on a product that shows it can take a certain amount of punishment and still work properly. This testing is optional for products sold in the U.S., but mandatory for products sold in Europe. There are slight differences between the FCC emissions limits and the European emissions limits. The FCC allows, as an alternative to meeting its limits, a product to meet the limits of the European standards. Over time, there has been a push to harmonize the emissions limits in the U.S. with those of Europe, and the FCC's allowance of the European limits as an alternative demonstrates this. So in the U.S., there are no FCC-governed limits for product susceptibility, but that's not true in the military sector. The military has a comprehensive EMC test battery that does go into product susceptibility testing. In a lot of ways, the U.S. military standards are similar to the European commercial standards for immunity 
but they are also more rigorous. They are certainly more extensive and restrictive in what emissions levels they allow. The NRC's EMI-RFI requirements encompass all of these different standards. It has produced guidance that takes into account the differences in the test standards and the limits. To further interpret the NRC's guidance, EPRI has produced a standard that goes into much greater depth by including extended discussions on the differences, strengths, and weaknesses of the many different test standards. It's at this point where things start rapidly increasing in complexity. Navigating the different standards can be precarious work and it can quickly overwhelm you. That's why it's important to know these fundamentals. Now let's review the key points covered in this video. EMC is the branch of electrical engineering that works to limit conducted and radiated emissions created by digital devices because those emissions can interfere with the proper operation of other digital and electronic devices. EMC also works to reduce a device's susceptibility to emissions from other electronic devices. The nuclear industry is not immune to the concerns of EMC. In fact, it's a big deal that has serious safety implications especially when the susceptible devices perform safety-related functions. In the nuclear industry, EMC is referred to by its older terms of EMI and RFI. These two acronyms are often used together and interchangeably, and they essentially mean the same thing. Both terms are folded into the term EMC, which stands for Electromagnetic Compatibility. The main difference between all three acronyms is that EMC is the modern label given to this profession and it puts a positive spin on things by emphasizing its goal of making digital products compatible with their electromagnetic environment. Government agencies around the world have passed laws regulating commercial product emissions in most cases and susceptibility in some. In the US, the FCC is the regulating body that has imposed limits on radiated and conducted emissions for all digital devices sold or marketed in the U.S. that use clock frequencies of 9 kHz or higher. European laws have placed similar restrictions on digital devices, forbidding them by law to be sold unless they meet the requirements of the EMC directive. But not only do the European standards impose restrictions on emissions, they also impose minimum requirements on a product's ability to withstand electromagnetic interference. They call this product immunity. Finally, the U.S. military has its own set of EMC standards. The military sector was where concern about EMC in the U.S. first arose due to the critical nature and mission of the equipment and electronics employed. The military's EMC requirements are generally much more comprehensive and rigorous than both the FCC requirements and the European commercial standards. The military standards cover both emissions and immunity, which it refers to as susceptibility. The NRC has endorsed a variety of standards from all three of these sectors. Many of the standards overlap in various places, and none are truly identical with each other. Since the NRC has endorsed all three, and in some cases it has even introduced its own recommended limits, understanding if a piece of equipment conforms with the NRC's guidelines can be a challenge. Add to this witch's brew the fact that EPRI has released its own guidelines that attempt to reconcile all of these different standards, as well as to justify deviations from the NRC's guidelines, all with the purpose of making it easier for plant engineers to comply with the EMC requirements while keeping the NRC happy. It may sound overwhelming, but we will find that EPRI has done a pretty good job of sorting and organizing the different tests and standards. If you found this lesson helpful, please share it with others. Thank you.